Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for the opportunity of being in this house. We, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to magnify your name, the freedom and liberty that we have to do that here, Lord God. And uh, I pray in these next few moments as we just gather around your word, as we spend these moments in your word, I, I pray that you will help us. I pray that you'll reveal things to us in your word, that you will reignite something within us that, that just burns with a holy passion and desire uh, for you, Lord God. And so I pray that you'll just help us as we uh, journey with this, uh, this scripture this, this morning. I pray in your precious name for those of our family and friends, uh, many again who are away from us today. I pray that you'll be with them, that you'll bless them, that you'll encourage them, and that you'll give them more of your grace and mercy and peace. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so I guess uh, Tristan uh, mentioned last week and said uh, he'd been given a long chapter. Uh, if you kind of look forward to this chapter 15, you recognize in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that it's a very uh, long chapter. And I think it's important that we're going to read it together uh, because I will encourage you to read it at home. But let's be honest, some of you won't. And so we're going to read it together here. As a church, as a family, we're going to go through this. We've been journeying through this series of Corinth, uh, this letter from Paul to the church in Corinth, this letter of love, uh, but this letter of correction, uh, this letter of love to a church that is thriving, that is, that is alive, that is buzzing, that has got diversity in it, there's new life in it, but they're getting some things dramatically wrong. And, and Paul loves this church in Corinth, but also Paul wants to correct this church in Corinth, not for Paul's sake, but for the kingdom of God's sake. Uh, we represent the kingdom of God here. We represent the kingdom of God here, and so we need to make sure we live lives that represent the kingdom well. Otherwise, we are in doing an injustice to the kingdom that we claim to serve and to follow. And so Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth, and we've been journeying through this, and we'll, we'll bring this journey to a conclusion uh, next week. I hope you've enjoyed the series. I, I hope it's been encouraging. I hope that it's been challenging. I hope that it's been correcting. I'll be honest with you, when, when I talked with our leadership team about this last year, when we talked about journeying through Corinth, I didn't know that it was going to be for such a time as this. And you need to understand this is something that God had burdened on our heart last year to bring this year, and for me it's poignant in its timing. And therefore I don't believe this is, is, is of ourselves as a leadership, but this is God. And if God speaks, uh, we are required to listen. And if you've, not, if you've missed some of these things, and, um, I would ask you to revisit them on our YouTube channel. Um, Andy and the team kind of put these on there every week, and, and they're quality to listen to. And if you've missed any or you need to be reminded, then I would encourage you to do so. We need to be reminded. Don't think we've ticked off Corinth now, by the way, and you think, well, I never need to read that again. Um, you need to read it over and over again and allow it to challenge you and change you and equip you. So 1 Corinthians at chapter 15, we're going to read this together in verse 1. Paul writes, now, now let me re remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you'll stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And last of all, as though I'd been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I'm the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. I've worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I but God who was working through me by his grace. And so it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message that you've already believed. But tell me this, 
Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why have some of you saying there'll be no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. <clears throat> and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we're to be more pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised at the first harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom of God over to God and the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures said, God has put all things under his authority. Of course, when it says all things under his authority, that does not include God himself who gave Christ his authority. Then when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority so that God, who gave his Son authority over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. If the dead will not be raised, what point is there in people being baptized for those who are dead? Why do it unless the dead will someday rise again? And why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. And this is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts, those people of Ephesus, if there'll be no resurrection from the dead? And if there's no resurrection, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. Don't be fooled by those who say such things. For bad company corrupts good character. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame I say that some of you don't know God at all. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a, what a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh, one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in the heavens and the bodies on the earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and stars each have another kind, and even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It's the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they'll be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they'll be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We'll not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in a blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. 
and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power, but thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. I guess when I read this passage... I can't help it because I'm reminded of funerals. Uh, This passage is often uh, read at funerals. And and actually, there's tons of things in this passage that can be really complicated. Uh, There's lots of verses in here. And there's one verse in particular that is really complicated. It's hard to get our heads around. It's hard to grasp and understand. And uh, this morning, time has really gone. So I kind of want to simplify some things for you this morning. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. The resurrected body of Jesus is alive forevermore. It's not just simply in our hearts and our minds. It's not a distant memory that we have of Jesus that keeps him alive. He's alive. As followers of Jesus Christ, we believe that he is alive. There's some strange stories in the Bible, isn't there? Let's be honest, there is, isn't there? As we read the Scriptures, as we journey through the story of the Bible, there's some really strange retelling of the accounts that perhaps as we read them, we can be a little bit sceptical, can't we? Let's be honest, there's lots of things in Scriptures we read it and we go, did that really happen? I mean, we converse with other people of other faiths as they begin to explore and tell us of their faith. We kind of secretly mock them and go, they believe that? How could they be so gullible? How could they be so gullible and believe those kind of things? Yet actually, as followers of Jesus Christ, if we take some of these stories in Scripture, well, some other people can call us gullible. We only need to consider some of the stories of old. 2 Kings chapter 6, the story of Elisha and the floating axe head. Go figure. An iron axe that floats. I mean, we read that story, and in kids' life, perhaps they'll teach that story at one day, and the kids in their, in their naivety will go, oh, that's wonderful, that's great, and they'll believe it. But as adults, we say, a floating axe head? Really? And if we believe it, then if we tell that story to other people outside, well, they're going to think that you're a little bit crazy. That actually you're just believing in fairy tales. And if the floating axe head wasn't enough, then you journey into Numbers 22 and you've got the talking donkey. Which many of you will think to you, that will say to you, you've been watching way too much of Shrek. This story that is bizarre and strange and weird, and actually if we read it, we kind of try to make excuses around it because, well, if it's a story a little bit too far, isn't it? The story of Jonah in the belly of a fish, surviving for three days, and then being spewed up on the shore in order to deliver a message. I'm here. What a crazy story. And if we think about that story and we tell that story to others again for children, it's wonderful and it's accepted, and they just embrace it. But for adults, we question it. And we think, well, did it really happen? And if we move from the Old uh, Testament stories, when we move to the New Testament stories, the life of Jesus and the miracles, many of us try to even just explain them away and say, well, they're just ancient scriptures and it didn't mean what it really meant and it meant something else. Or those who were demon-possessed and had deliverance from the King of Kings. And so these are stories that are incredible. These are stories that blow our mind. These stories that actually don't fit into our culture and our surroundings. These are stories for, well, they're for stories for ages past, aren't they? Not for present today. And then if we move on to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And these stories are stretched too far. Have we simply misunderstood the, re- the scriptures that have been written? Have we simply misunderstood and misinterpreted an ancient text into a modern culture? In a recent survey by the BBC of those in our country in the UK who describe themselves as Christians, 25% of them said that they actually don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. A quarter of people in our nation, the UK, who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, a quarter of them don't actually believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And, and if you think, well, that's just the UK and of those who people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, a recent survey by the Telegraph newspaper surveyed the Church of England clergy, and a third of them either doubted or disbelieved in the physical resurrection of Jesus. Even this week, I was listening to the radio, and there was a debate on the radio by a theologian and a philosopher who were arguing the point that actually the, the resurrection, the physical resurrection of Jesus cannot have happened. It's a debate that goes on today because we live in a world where surely this story of resurrection is a story too far. It goes beyond what we know, And so for many of us as Christians, we try to fit it into our culture by trying to explain it away, by by using a different thought process, by perhaps skirting around the main issues, and perhaps we try to comply with the world around us or even move our goalposts so it fits the culture around us. But for Paul to the church in Corinth, who was doing exactly the same thing, the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ was fundamental to what they believed. No matter how crazy this story may first appear. Simply put, Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, if Jesus is dead, then Christianity is dead. But if Jesus is alive, then Christianity is alive. You see, apart from the resurrection of Jesus, there is no saviour, there is no salvation, there is no forgiveness of sins, there is no hope of a resurrected life. Apart from the resurrection of Jesus, it's just reduced to yet another good man who died. And as such, is simply no help to us at all in the present day or on our deathbed. No help whatsoever. Plainly stated, without the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, the few billion people on our planet who today follow Jesus Christ are gullible. They're foolish. Their hope for resurrection after life is simply the hope of fools who trust in a dead man to try and give them life. Therefore, the physical resurrection of the body of Jesus Christ is simply fundamental to our faith and it should never be compromised. Never be compromised. And Paul in this letter is simply reminding the church in Corinth that we need to remind ourselves over and over again that we believe in the physical resurrection of the body of Jesus Christ. In a world where Christianity was born, no one outside of Judaism believed in resurrection. They they believed in all sorts of things about life after death, as many do today. To some extent, it's the ultimate question. What happens after we die? And many people have theories and ideas, and many people have explanations of what they think will happen. Many people will have Stories and in, in Paul's day in this church in Corinth, yes, they had all those kind of views, but the physical resurrection of the body, well, no, that didn't exist. Even the Jewish belief in resurrection was about a people, a tribe, and not necessarily a person. And that would only ever happen at the end of the world as we know it. But the biblical evidence and the circumstantial of the evidence of resurrection are compelling. You just need to look at it. I mean, many of you will say, well, the biblical evidence, it's like a Bible supporting the Bible. 
And so that's hard to kind of put together. Yet the Bible is put together by so many different people from so many different backgrounds. You see, in the Bible, roughly 700 years before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Isaiah talks about it. Jesus himself spoke of his resurrection, even though the disciples misinterpreted it and thought differently about it, as we often do. According to the accounts in the Bible, Jesus' death wasn't about him just swooning or fainting or having his body replaced by a body double. He died. And as such was buried in a tomb. And it wasn't a tomb that was far away or a tomb that was hidden or secret. It was a tomb that was easy to find. It was a popular tomb. It was something where people could go to confirm the death of Jesus. The Bible records that Jesus appeared physically, not spiritually, physically three days following his death. Jesus' resurrected body was the same as his pre-resurrected body, the same yet different. You've got to read the accounts. It's recognizable, but it's been transformed. Jesus' resurrection was recorded in the Bible soon after its occurrence. Mark's gospel being written while the eyewitnesses are still being alive. It's not Chinese whispers that's gone on unchanged. It's something from eyewitnesses. People saw this. People were, were written down. Their accounts were recorded. Jesus' resurrection was celebrated by the early church right from the beginning. Jesus' resurrection convinced his earthly family that he was who he claimed to be. The Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus' resurrection was confirmed by most of his bitter enemies, such as Saul, who wrote this letter, became Paul. An enemy of the resurrection. He's transformed by the resurrection. You see, the resurrection is real. And as such, it has transformed people's lives. The resurrection is an effect and it has a cause. It has a cause, a cause and an effect. The disciples are transformed from fearful and timid people to bold and defiant people. The resurrection meant the disciples remained loyal to Jesus and didn't give up. The disciples' character remained true. Their worship changed. It altered because of the resurrection. Women are included in the story of resurrection. The entirety of the church centered its preaching on the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' tomb is not enshrined. Why? Because it's empty. There's no body there. Out of all the other major religions in the world, there's a shrine, there's a tomb to go and see. It's not the same for us. Not because we can't find him. It's because he's risen. And if this story is true, that we serve a risen Savior, which I believe it is true, then it should begin to transform the way we live our lives. Because we don't live the lives for ourselves, we live it for a risen Savior, who is alive forevermore. The church, after God, Jesus' resurrection, it exploded. It grew rapidly. And I love this. Professor C.D.F. Moore of Cambridge University ooh, said this, The birth and the rapid rise of the Christian church remain an unsolved enigma for any, histo any historian who refuses to take seriously the only explanation offered by the church itself, resurrection. You see, this faith that we follow, it's not a set of ideas. It isn't a path of spirituality. It isn't a rule of life. It isn't a political agenda. Because at the heart of Christianity is something very, very different. It is good news about an event which has happened in this world that we live an event which means that this world can never be the same again. And those who believe it, well, you're never going to be the same again either. Because without the resurrection, we are dead. But with the resurrection, with the resurrection, 
we are alive forevermore. Because of our Savior's resurrection, we too have a sure and certain hope. We too recognize that death has been defeated and it has been swallowed up in victory. So, brothers and sisters, as Paul ends this chapter, so, brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable in this. Be strong and immovable in this story of the resurrection. Work enthusiastically for the Lord because you need to know that nothing you do for God is useless. Church, we normally save this for Easter. He is risen. He is risen. So church, live like resurrected lives. Church, live like He is risen. Church, live like the resurrected lives, like He's caused us to live because our Savior, He's alive forevermore. Let's pray. <laughs> Jesus, You are alive. And we celebrate Your life. We love that through Your death, You have conquered death. We thank you that that death and everything it entails, well, if it had just been a death, well, there's no hope. But because of your certain resurrection, there's hope for every single one of us. For a brighter day, a new life, an eternity with you praising you and worshipping you, a life that we have never known before, a life with no death, a life with no fear, a life with no tragedy, a life with no sickness, all because your son deep defeated death and is alive forevermore. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will rejoice and we will sing and we will praise you because what you have done, because, Lord Jesus, you are alive. And because of your life, you have given us life. May we be a people determined to live resurrected lives. We ask in your precious name, Lord God. Amen.